Sick of Hecate. Scratch out their eyes. Cats, those ancient creatures of the night, hold an irresistible fascination with their elusive, some would say feminine, allure. Catwoman isn't evil. She's really, really naughty. She gets away with things. Even if she goes to jail, she'll get out. You know, she'll come back. Cat has nine lives. Catwoman's blend of feline and feminine appeal continues a tradition dating back more than 2,000 years to the ancient temples of Egypt. Cats were an aspect of the divine, the God made manifest on Earth. You wanted them to accompany you to the underworld. So cats were frequently mummified. Indeed, they would have face masks, coffins, sarcophagi, just like human beings. Cats probably were linked with sexual desire quite early because of their association with pagan fertility goddesses. They are good mothers. They are very fertile. So then you would associate that with fertility, thus with love, thus with beauty and sensuality and sex. So you would say, that woman moves with cat-like grace, or she's such a sex kitten, or she's such a pussy cat, or a nice tail. But during the Middle Ages, the public perception of cats changed from sexy to sinister as fears of witchcraft swept across Europe. As early as the 12th century, church authorities said that the devil and some of his favorite demons resided in black cats. Oh. <laughs> Speak of the angel. It was this fabulous potential interracial romance at a time when you didn't see much of that on television. Well, nobody purred like her in the kit. You know, she was just hot. That's one of the best parts of Catwoman is that whip. You know, that she can whip the man into shape. That's one of the most empowering things about Catwoman that we love. You know, she is a dominatrix. She tells the men what to do and where to go. Hey, stud. I thought we had something together. We do. Uh. Our queen of folklore, Heather Joseph Witham, picks up the scent of this story. You've got a young guy who wants a really hot car, usually a sports car. And young guys can't afford sports cars, and they can't afford, afford nice cars, certainly. So this is the only way that this sort of blue-collar, working-class young guy is going to be able to get such an awesome car. But sort of the moral of the story is that the blue-collar guy never can get something that he won't be able to afford like this unless it literally stinks. In 1998, in Carbon County, Pennsylvania, apparently some good old boys from the sounds of it were hanging out on their porch drinking beer and uh, they saw a raccoon go by and so they all opened fire on it. So they noticed that the raccoon's taken refuge in a drainage pipe. So one of the smart fellows goes over to the drainage pipe and he pours gasoline down there and he tries to light it. Unsuccessful at doing this, one of them decided to go down into the pipe to better light the gasoline and get the raccoon out. Uh, at which point the gasoline actually did ignite and it shot this guy. Uh, out the tube at a high rate of speed. He goes shooting straight out of this pipe and he flies about 200 feet right over the house and falls and manages to get up relatively unharmed. The target? A used fuselage and several spare windshields. There are loads of stories where one country pokes fun at another, particularly where America is involved. Mythbusters folklorist Heather Joseph Witham. There are versions of this narrative where it's the Royal Canadian Air Force, for example, that invents the chicken gun and it's borrowed by American airplane manufacturers who don't know how to use the gun right. In 1998, a Charlottesville man attempting to do a large amount of laundry stuffed his washing machine with 50 pounds of clothes. So he wants to get all of his laundry into the machine at once. So he takes this 50 pounds of laundry and he's jumping up and down on top of the machine to get it in there when his foot accidentally kicks the on button. He sort of fell into the machine. His legs got stuck by the laundry and he banged into the shelf. He hit some bleach. Bleach fell, blinded him. Apparently he might have even swallowed some. At this point, his dog runs in to see what the commotion is about. And as he spins around, this time he hits the shelf again and some baking soda pours out. 
This startles the dog, who then urinates on the baking soda. Causing a small explosion, at which point the laundry machine went into its spin cycle, turning him at about 70 miles an hour, where he smacked his head into a shelf and died immediately. Well, that sounds ridiculous. <laughs> I think partially this story is playing upon young girls' fears of pregnancy and their mother's fears that the young girls could become pregnant. I mean, it's almost the same as the story that you can get pregnant by going in the swimming pool if there happens to be sperm floating around in that pool despite the chlorine. The octopus is perhaps the most recent incarnation. Other recent incarnations of this narrative are where a boy is um, getting water out of a garden hose and he swallows frog eggs or newts, toads. Going back to medieval times, you have serpents and snakes, perhaps the most wicked seeming creature. Many stories were fables created to scare children. Others were chilling examples of what would happen to sinners. Sometimes the sufferers would regurgitate the unwelcome visitor, but usually the episode would end badly. So it's something taking you over, something insidious, something making you bad. And I'm sure in some versions of the narrative, you did something wrong to let it in. According to folklorist Heather Joseph Witham, History records that as a dangerous combination. The first instance we know of this occurring was April 14th in 1831. The Broughton Suspension Bridge spanned the River Irwell in Manchester, England. There was a group of military men marching across this bridge when a pin collapsed and a chain broke and part of the bridge actually collapsed into the river. The bacteria that lives, well, you know where. The belief is that you shouldn't leave your toothbrush in the bathroom, and particularly not too close to the toilet, because there's all sorts of bacteria floating in the air, which ends up on your toothbrush and therefore in your mouth. Skiing behind a rowboat? Who ever heard of such a thing? Folklorist Heather Joseph Witham says this myth was made up by rowers for rowers. You're not going to have construction workers talking about a rowing eight or water skiing, but you're going to have rowers talking about this. Probably not even water skiers because this functions for rowers as a way to um, comment on what they're doing, as a way for them to comment upon their sport. It's saying, look how fast we manly men can go. Toilets and cleanliness are the subject of many an urban legend, including this one. There's a young couple honeymooning somewhere in the Caribbean, and they come back to their room and they see that it's been ransacked. They've been burgled of just about everything. There's only two things remaining, their camera and their toothbrushes. So they go out and they purchase new clothes and other necessities, and they end up having a fantastic time. So they get home and they develop their film. And upon looking at the different photographs, they get to one that, what's that? And they notice that one thief has taken a picture of the other thief mooning, and the picture is of his backside with their toothbrushes sticking out. According to folklorist Heather Joseph Witham, this story has endured because people often cheer for the underdog. The idea is, you know, David against Goliath, the little man, um, really winning out over the concrete authority, the faceless, nameless concrete authority. So, Jamie, uh, what are we working on? Why are there ducks pooping all over your desk? Well, the myth is that a duck's quack does not echo. That sounds kind of simple. Well, I guess we'll figure out a way of making it complicated, won't we? This really is an internet story. Not even a story, just a little factoid. And it generally comes out on these internet lists of facts that are very odd. Um, in the past, they would have circulated as Xerox lore or fax lore. This legend also links up with the idea of alien implants, the idea that aliens are implanting us with some kind of chip to control our minds or to monitor what we're doing and what we're saying. There are multiple legends about being buried alive because apparently there have been stories about this since the ancient times. Heather Joseph Witham, resident folklorist. Social myths are her specialty. One version of the narrative is that your friend's great-great-grandma was very ill and in fact she was lying in a coma for several days at which point she died. Now when the doctor pronounced her dead, her husband came and 
was looking at the body and said, she's not dead, she's not dead. We've been married for over 50 years. I can feel her innermost thoughts. I know everything about her, she's not dead. Now, every night, this man is having a recurring nightmare. He wakes up, he sees his wife crying at the coffin, screaming, I'm alive, help me, help me. He has this dream every night. So finally, after a week of these hysterical calls, the doctor, together with the local authorities, dig the woman up. And when they open the coffin, what they find is all her nails are bent back and there are very clear scratches all along the inside of the coffin lid. So you have the story in the 17th century, Marjorie Alphenstone of Scotland gets actually buried. A few hours later at nighttime, robbers come, they dig her up and they are going to take the jewelry off her when she groans. And they all go running off into the night in terror. And she sits up, walks home, and outlives her husband. Many of these stories are relatively recent. You have a man in South Africa in 1993 who is pronounced dead after a car accident. He spends two days in some kind of metal casket above ground at which point he wakes up, and unfortunately he's not very happy apparently because his fiance won't take him back, believing that he's a zombie, come back to get her. Well, there's this myth that if you fall off a high structure like a bridge or a crane or something over water and you throw a hammer in front of you, that it'll save your life because it'll break the surface tension of the water. No way. This story has been told about the Sydney Harbor Bridge and also about the Golden Gate Bridge in San Francisco, California. The story is told among people who work on bridges, um, construction workers, people who might fall off of a bridge and like to have the idea, at least subconsciously, that there's something they can do about it, that there's some way to save themselves. Pennies have long been associated with luck, in this case, really bad luck, but normally very good luck. If you find a penny, pick it up, and all day you'll have good luck. If you pass up a penny, you'll lose a dollar. Uh, if you find a penny that's heads up, it's particularly good luck, and you should carry it with you as a charm. A bride should always have a penny in her shoe, and following the wedding, she should take that penny and get it made into a piece of jewelry a pendant or a bracelet or something like that. Have you actually heard the myth of the uh, tanning bed cooking the insides of the bride-to-be? <laughs> oh, yes. There's a woman who's getting ready for a special occasion, and she decides she'll look fabulous in her dress if she's very tan. So she goes to a tanning salon, and she's very annoyed that they have this half-hour daily limit on tanning. So she goes there, and then she goes to several other places, and basically is tanning for hours a day. After a few days of this, her husband says, honey, you smell kind of funny. So she showers, you still smell kind of funny. So she goes to the doctor and the doctor does numerous tests upon which he finds that she's microwaved her internal organs and only has two weeks to live. Now this story has been told and retold so many times, it's a very popular narrative. Indeed, it was published in at least two Dear Abby columns. So it's got a lot of veracity, a lot of people believe it. Um, also, the industry magazine, Tanning Trends, had to publish an article telling people that it's not true, don't worry about it, but clearly the narrative is still out there. Do tanning beds put out microwaves? They put out nothing of the sort. They put out light waves, and that's all there is to it. If you overheat water in a microwave, you may take the cup out or the bowl and then the water is going to explode in your face, injuring you or burning you in some horrific way. And they put some gunpowder in there and they shoot off this cannon. The entire body of the cannon exploded, killing half the townspeople. And the mayor, in his infinite wisdom, looks up and said, if we have so many dead, how many left of the enemy can there be? That's the earliest known record of spin, I think. In America, if it looks like a rose and it smells like a rose, it's a rose. And if you have your certs and your mouth is fresh and you feel fresh, then perhaps you just aren't drunk anymore. Basically, it's a bit of practical advice. Run if it's raining and you won't get as wet than if you're walking. Seems to make sense to me. So what exactly is this myth? Well, it's an email myth 
that says that the use of a cell phone near a gas station can cause an accidental explosion. Uh, and in fact, people have bought into this and on some gas stations near the gas pumps, you can see a sign saying, please don't use your cell phone here. But also, it's a very good story. And a very good story is very powerful and promotes belief. <laughs> There's a myth that when you go up on an airplane, the reduction in pressure will explode your implants. The basic story is that there's a woman with silicone implants on an airplane, and there's a depressurized cabin because it's a local flight, perhaps from LA to San Francisco. And as the plane goes higher, the implants get bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger until finally they explode as she's walking down the aisle to the lavatory to see what's going on with her implants. But the story has one more chapter. Adam now tries an inflatable brassiere. Jamie, you want to tie me up? An earlier version of this narrative that took place in the 1950s dealt with a national sales manager for the inflatable bra uh, was on, again, a flight in a depressurized plane. She was wearing her product, as any good salesperson would, and as the plane got higher, her bra got bigger and bigger and bigger and the other passengers were kind of starting to freak out so she had to go spend the rest of the uh, flight in the cabin with the pilots which you couldn't do these days. This one is the barrel of bricks myth. Oh, this is the one the guy is trying to take bricks off of a roof and the barrel's too heavy and it drags him up, hits him on the way up. Cracks his skull, injures his collarbone, keeps shooting straight up until his, he's about two knuckles deep into the pulley. Of course, the barrel exploded when it hit the ground, losing the load. Then his weight was obviously heavier than the barrel's weight. The barrel goes back up and this guy goes back down. He hits the barrel about halfway down. And I'd even heard that he, he then let go of the rope, and what was remaining of the barrel came down and hit him. But he survives. Yes. According to folklorist Heather Joseph Witham, this story regularly pops up in print. It purports to be an accident report, or a worker's compensation claim, or something like that. So it's by showing the written form of it, it has more veracity and seems more truthful. It's almost like Wile E. Coyote on one of his adventures, um, getting hit here, getting hit there, dying here, dying there. Um, for some reason, we, we think that's funny or interesting. Well, in the case of this particular story, it was printed in a 1918 joke book. So it seems that it may have started as the brainchild of one person. A joke, maybe, but Adam and Jamie have proved the barrel of bricks myth is possible. Usually, when you hear the narrative, the guy has a name. It's Joseph Patrick O'Malley, a more Irish name you couldn't get. So I suspicion that part of this is a stereotypical legend, and uh, it promoted the stereotype of the drunken, thick Irishman. Comets are enormous balls of nuclear energy hurtling through space, destroying everything in their path. Uh, for centuries, comets have been seen as harbingers of doom. The mother of all comets is thought to be Halley's Comet, not due back over Earth until the year 2060. But in the spring of 1997, we will be visited by the less famous comet, Hale-Bopp. And in cosmic terms, this one will miss us only by a whisker. People have many, many beliefs about comets. For example, if you see a comet, you'll die soon after. Or if you see a comet and you don't cross yourself and tell someone, then you'll lose a finger. All sorts of peculiar things like that. UCLA folklorist Heather Joseph Witham notes that historical events are often tied to a passing comet. For example, in 1066, there was a comet, and just afterwards, the Normans invaded England and the Battle of Hastings took place, and England became a Norman country. People who see this, the belief is reinforced. Something happened. But it's not for you or I necessarily to say that the comet didn't predict the event, because we don't really know. Earth. There are some connections between comets and catastrophic Earth events. There was a really long, hot um, summer and drought in the eastern United States in 1762. It was thought a comet predicted this. And once again, there was a, um, a comet just before an incredible earthquake in 1811 that actually sank New Madrid, Mississippi. In fact, that same 1811 comet coincided with Napoleon's defeat at Waterloo. Civilizations have looked to the sky for centuries, and the ancient Greeks even established guidelines for how comets would affect our planet. 
Ptolemy in the second century wrote that the size of the comet uh, will tell the comet's meaning. The color of the comet will tell what kind of problem it will bring, wind, rain, drought, whatever. And where in the zodiac the comet was tells which country is going to be affected. Although scientists have yet to determine the color of hale bop or its place in the zodiac, there is no question that its size is colossal, a fact that Ptolemy would say spells disaster for those who will cross the comet's path. From the boundaries of the universe to the depth of your soul, embark on a journey through the unknown and unexplained as we explore mysteries, magic, and miracles. People use knowledge where they have it. If they know how to light a fire, they will use the knowledge to light a fire. But if they don't know when the rains are going to come, that's where science hasn't yet entered the personal realm, that's where folk beliefs are going to come in, in the realm of the mysterious. There are folk beliefs in every part of life. And usually, people are not foolish who have superstitions or folk beliefs. Everybody has some kinds of traditions or beliefs. Everybody does, um, despite if they're the most scientific person. You know, the most scientific person may wear his lucky yellow shirt to his next basketball game. Another concern of the ancients was for the couple's fertility. That's why people, sometimes they still throw rice, or now I think it's bird seed more commonly. Um, it started out as throwing wheat, because wheat was a fertile symbol. Other modern-day customs spawned by superstitions include the wearing of jewelry. Many amulets and talismans that you would wear in your ears or on your neck are being worn as fashion jewelry now, but were previously to protect you or to keep away the evil eye. Another superstition, which fortunately has not found its way into the present day, involves the rescue of a drowning person. It was thought that the gods of the deep chose someone to come down to them. So if you were going to save somebody, from drowning on a ship. Well, that was going to anger the gods because the gods asked for this person, so you better not interfere with it. So you let the person drown. Joining us now is folklorist Heather Joseph. She says that the near death or death experience is often part of the doppelganger phenomenon. Welcome, Heather. Thanks for joining Thank us. You. Heather, you've, uh, you've traced these uh, doppelganger legends. They're, they're pretty yes. universal, aren't they? They are universal. We see them from coming from everywhere and dating back from classical antiquity to the present. Um, and stories like Angie's are very, very common. That's the most common type of doppelganger that we see, one that appears just before someone's going to die miles and miles away, and usually to someone very, very close to that person. Yeah, and it's, uh, it also, as we've heard before, is connected to uh, a strong emotional bond and the stress that goes with that. Absolutely. Um, often you will know that the person is sick. You will know that someone is, is ill. There's a story uh, I was reading about recently that Queen Elizabeth I, uh, her, one of her ladies-in-waiting, had left the room while she was ill, and she saw the double of Queen Elizabeth, and uh, later that evening she died. And there's the other belief as well that if you see your own double, that you will die probably by that evening. Is that and, right? Yeah, that's, that's, that's a pretty Something universal belief. Something to think about tonight. Yeah, you, you, don't, you don't want to see your own double. Yeah. Um, we understand that Empress Catherine the Great of Russia saw her own doppelganger, and uh, she ordered her guards to shoot on it. Uh, what are the explanations for what these are? Um, it's not for folklorists necessarily to explain how this is happening, but rather what it's doing for the person. For Angie, I think it ended up being a positive experience. It was something she, she knew that the person loved her enough to come say goodbye. That's how we've often heard these stories, that they've become very healing and provide some sense of closure. What's curious yeah. scientifically is the phenomena where it accurately represents, you know, like a phone conversation that you can later verify that that in something fact is what happening. happened. That's yeah. very strange. What is the difference between a doppelganger and a vision after yeah, someone, someone has, has died. died? Well, a doppelganger usually has to do with someone who is alive. For example, it's called filia in Norway. And it's thought that the doppelganger is born in the person's call. And it's actually sort of, it's alive the whole time you are, and it dies when you die. So it's almost like the doppelganger would be like a projection of the self, of the soul, the other half of you, the good, the evil. 
I, I had an experience where I was in a position where I didn't want to, I just simply didn't want to move because I was so comfortable and I had to turn off the stereo and I went and turned off the stereo and I turned back around and I was still lying on the bed. Would I, in that particular situation, when I turned around and saw my own self on the bed, my physical body, mm -hmm. would I then could be de defined as a doppelganger in that moment? I, well, you I, didn't die that night, though. She didn't <laughs> die. Right? No, 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 Which is what no, you said. You saw herself. Thank yeah. God you yeah, didn't. But at that moment, I was obviously in two places at the same time, and I was very much aware of it. Right. And usually we call that astral projection, don't we? Which is something else. This is, this is, it shows, even though this is a universal belief, you can see how culturally specific it is. Because mm -hmm. here we would call that astral projection. You know, a hundred years ago, we never heard of that. Or in Norway, where they're calling it a filio, or in Germany, a doppelganger. It's called different things, but I think technically that would be a doppelganger. So, yeah. Heather, this is right up, up your alley, that, that uh, the, there may be um, a universal set of phenomena, but different cultures give them different, different names, interpretations. describe different descriptions. Yeah. Yeah. We okay. have a different language. For some people in this cultural milieu, um, an alien has more relevance than a ghost. Many, many ghost stories are directed at young people. A typical American legend, uh, in fact, the classic automobile legend that has to do with ghosts is called the vanishing hitchhiker. And almost everybody has heard this. Um, usually you hear it from a friend of a friend. You're telling the story and you say, a friend of my friend told me this. Thus, it has authenticity. Also, usually it uh, is connected to a specific place, a specific road, maybe even a specific name. So the story always seems very authentic. There are many, many legends about ghosts that become localized or regionalized. Um, sometimes they have to do with a real event. For example, when Susan Smith murdered her two little boys, she had them in the back of the car and she put the car into the lake and they died there. Recently we've seen another carload of people died at the very same spot. Thus, legends are already beginning to be circulated about that place, that perhaps the spirits of the little boys are there and they're seeking to bring other people to their watery death with them. So sometimes we find otherworldly explanations from real events like that. 